it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Tonight's story is a third piece featured by the author known as Luke Hemingway, the writer of the Robert Cassidy and White Van Man stories that I featured here recently. Now, as you're aware, some of the plots and characters in Mr. Hemingway's stories are often of the extreme or disturbing variety. If you're of a sensitive disposition, then perhaps this may not be the story for you. But if not, then uh, sit back and prepare to meet Mr. Zander. I warn you now, the details of the events I'm about to disclose, they still haunt my dreams and affect my daily life, and while I've had years to process them in counselling and psychotherapy, they still make my spine shiver. If you're sensitive to vile threats and stuff involving children, then I think you should stop listening. Otherwise, well, here is my story. My ordeal began back when I was a little girl. I remember the day it all started, just like it was yesterday. My name is Jessica, and at the time of these events, I was 12 years old and living in Cherokee County with my family. The family consisted of both my parents and my two siblings, Daniel, who was 16, and my little sister, Rachel, who was 6. We also had a dog named Bear. He was a beautiful, three-year-old German-Caucasian shepherd. The ordeal began on the 5th of September, 2002, when I was walking home from Dean Rusk Middle School. i just moved out from elementary school for the first time and i just completed my first week back and naturally I was keen to get home and kickstart my weekend of seeing my friends, playing with my Barbies, all the good stuff. Now here's where I should mention the school had an assembly the first day back. They had every kid packed into the biggest gym hall in the school as they had an important message for us all. A pupil from Cahaley Elementary School in the neighbouring city hadn't returned after the summer break. His mutilated corpse was found close by the school in a wooded area. The school didn't go into details, naturally, but rumours were being passed around by pupils at my school about what had happened to him. There were hundreds of stories, but the most commonly shared details were that the boy had been raped multiple times, before and after his death. He'd been violently sodomised with a rusty pipe, and he'd been castrated. Naturally, these were still just rumours. I had no way of knowing if these details were true. Social media wasn't as big back then as it is now, so grisly details were much easier to keep under wraps. However, nevertheless, this boy had been brutally killed by someone who was still free to roam the streets. The school ordered that every child should be picked up by a parent. Failing this, you needed to walk home with a buddy. On this fateful day, my dad was working out of town again, which he did often at the time of these events. My mother was stuck in traffic and wouldn't be able to pick me up. My allocated buddy was also off sick that day. Well, you might come to say we brought this on ourselves, but can any of you really say that you never had that, oh, this won't happen to us, moment? Maybe it was the fact that this horrible crime had happened in a completely different city. Maybe it was the fact that I lived less than a 30-minute walk from my school, Maybe it was complacency and naivety, or maybe it was a combination of all three. Either way, it led me to walking home alone that day. I was just passing through the Hickory Flat Village when a man fell in step with me from behind. Oh, uh, excuse me, little girl. I've lost my dog. I don't suppose you've seen him, have you? He said, pulling out a picture of a golden retriever. There was something off about the picture, though. It didn't look like a picture he'd taken of his dog. It just looked like a picture of a dog. Like it torn it out of a book or something. I told him I hadn't seen a dog and kept on walking, hoping he'd get the hint and go bother someone else. I, uh, really miss him, you know. He likes the woods. He's probably hiding in the woods nearby. Well, if I, uh, had a friend to help me look, I bet I could find him a whole lot quicker. What do you say? Woods are just five minutes from here, he said, his hand reaching out for mine. Well, I made sure to put it out of reach. Sorry, I'm not supposed to talk to strangers, I said timidly before adding. I have to get home. His face still remained with this eerie, creepy smile where he just showed the very bottoms of his front two teeth. I looked up at him and 
he looked dead behind his eyes. Oh, sorry, uh, how silly of me. My name's Alex, but my pupils call me Mr. Zan. I'm about to teach your school. There, now, we're not strangers. So, uh, can you help me find my dog, please? He attempted. Well, he didn't look like a teacher to me. He looked too wild to be a teacher. Late twenties, early thirties, and he was pale. His hair was on the scruffy side, curling at the tips. Every hair on his face and head was as black as black can get. His intensity and just his demeanour alone was unsettling, and I knew I needed to get away from Mr. Zander. I'm sorry about your dog. I hope you find him, I said, and I began to make haste towards my house. Oh, the man, who now seemed to give absolutely zero fucks that his dog was missing, dropped the pitcher and began to pursue me. So, oh, where do you live? I bet you I know a shortcut. Oh, I've lived here a long time. It's far too dangerous walking on these main roads. Too many cars and bad drivers. I know a shortcut through the park. Shall I show you? His voice was borderline orgasmic. Looking back now, I think he was imagining what he'd do to me once we'd left the crowded and busy road. I decided to just ignore him and keep walking forward. He didn't give in, though, and he followed me home, keeping no more than a foot behind me. Oh, um, I'm about to go pick up some sweets from my office. Do you like sweets? <laughs> You're a little girl, of course you do. Why don't you come help me pick some sweets and then you can come back to my house and eat them with me? That sounds like fun, right? He said in the most superficial joy. He sounded like he was doing an impersonation of a children's entertainer. I could tell he was trying to get me to trust him. But thankfully, I didn't. I told myself that if I simply ignored the man, then finally he'd see I wasn't buying his bullshit and leave me alone. But he didn't. He kept following me and making really creepy small talk, like asking if my mommy was home and... Did I have a boyfriend yet? As I ran to the corner, I realized why he was still pursuing me. The Hickory Flat Village was now ending, and once we passed a small church coming up on the right-hand side, there was nothing by the road for around half a mile but trees. This sick weirdo would only need to wait for a break in the traffic in order to drag me into the tree line without any witnesses. And I think the man sensed it too because his small talk and his attempts to lure me had now stopped. He was now breathing very heavily, and when I looked back at him, he was pulling on a pair of black leather gloves. My heart began to pound, and that feeling of anxiety prey gets when a predator looms up. Yep, I had that in spades. I started to pick up the pace, but so did he. I heard his footsteps hit the ground louder and louder as he started to jog, and he got closer. And then, just as he whispered, I'm going to tear you in half, my little princess. Another voice shouted over. Jess, come on, it's going to rain, my brother shouted from the end of the road. My mama clearly called him on the house phone and told him to make himself useful. He clearly wasn't happy about being pried away from Smackdown Shut Your Mouth to come meet his little sister halfway, and he would no doubt complain all the way home, but I've never been so happy to see him. I turned back around to see Mr. Zander was no longer behind me. In fact, I couldn't see him at all. The only trace of him was a section of the woods by the side of the road. They were still swaying back and forth, as if someone had just burst into them. Me and my brother walked back to the house. Now, as expected, our conversation consisted mainly of him moaning at me for not being able to walk home alone, adding that he used to walk home alone when he was younger than me. I know for a fact that was a lie, but... I was too busy thinking about what could have happened had he not come to meet me. I wrote my encounter with Mr. Zandroff as just a one-off creepy encounter. However, that run-in was simply the start of a long and terrifying ordeal. Part 2 Over the next couple of days, I began to notice Mr. Zander around my neighborhood. At various times throughout the day, he'd drive past my house very slowly. Sometimes he'd simply wave, whereas other times he'd just stare out of the window with that creepy wild smile that showed no teeth. 
His eyes were always wide and wild, like a hungry lion eyeing a wounded gazelle. I told my mum about my encounter with Mr. Zander and the sightings of her in the area. A typical 90s mother mentality, she assumed I had an overactive imagination. She told me I'd overreacted. Mr. Zander was most likely just a strange and socially awkward person who generally had lost his dog. She added that he probably lives nearby and he's just waving as he recognises me. At the time, my father was working away. He was a long-distance trucker. He'd return after five or six days on the road, spend a day with the family, and then off he goes again. I think my father would have known this Mr. Zander was bad news, but my mum was a woman who saw the good in everyone. However, five days after the initial encounter with Mr. Zander, even my mother couldn't write him off anymore. I'd spotted Mr. Zander's car slowly drive past the school gates during my recess hours, every day since meeting him. He was clearly obsessed with me, as he was stalking my every movement. On the Wednesday, I'd been unable to sleep due to a fever. I woke up with a headache and a sore throat, so my mum allowed me to stay home with her. I spent most of the day in bed due to fatigue, but that night, my father arrived home. I wasn't due back until Friday morning, but here he was. In the morning, despite feeling a lot better, my parents told me that I wasn't going to school today. I was confused at first, as my parents were always usually talking about my attendance, but hey, I didn't argue it. I grabbed the day off with both hands. But when my mother dropped Rachel off at nursery and Daniel had left for college, my parents asked me to come sit at the table with them. Now, at this point, I knew something serious had happened. My father looked at me, sternly, all business. My mother looked a wreck, completely tormented, her hand covering her mouth and chin. I want you to tell me about this Mr. Zander person that you met. Did you talk to him at all? My father asked. I looked back at him, careful with my answer. I couldn't help but glance at my mum. Um, mum said he's just a strange man who has problems making friends, I answered coyly. Oh, I'm so sorry, Jess. Mommy got it so wrong and I should have listened to you. My mom could barely finish her sentence due to choking up. My father comforted her as I looked at them both, confused. Dad, what's going on? I probed. My father turned back to me to address the issue at hand. You're not in trouble, Jess. Do you hear me? We're not mad. We just need to know what you told him. My father's question confused me. I thought back carefully in my mind to the encounter with Mr. Zander. I didn't tell him anything. He asked me to find his dog, but he scared me, so I ignored him and walked home. I informed my father. Are you sure, Jess? There's nothing you could be forgetting, he added. I shook my head definitively, maintaining my eye contact to show I wasn't lying. My dad looked disturbed by this. A look of horror, anger, and puzzlement washed over his face. Then how does he know your name? How does he know your sister's name? How does he know where you live? My dad's questions were fired at me quickly as he went off on a tangent. I don't know, I said, whimpering and quivering. Well, they say children sense and mirror their parents' anguish. And I can tell you from this experience, that is true. My mother's crying and father's panic told me this wasn't good. Not good at all. Well, however he found out, you must stay away from him, Jess. I mean, oh, I mean this in the strongest possible terms. Mr. Zander is a very dangerous and disturbed human being. Your mother will drop you and pick you up from school, no exceptions. I've spoken with your teachers and let them know what's going on. They've said if your mother ever can't make it to pick you up... They've assured me one of the staff will bring you home. I sat there listening to my father lay all these new rules on me, whilst I sat wondering what had happened between my mother saying I was imagining all this and her calling my father home from work early. I decided to ask, and I wish I hadn't. Yesterday, when you were ill in bed, I, uh, I received a telephone call on our landline. I said, hello, Murphy resident. They didn't answer. All I could hear was a deep, raspy breathing. I put the phone down, assuming it was a cross line or something. 
my mother recounted. However, she began to stutter as she was building up to the worst part. They called back though, but this time they spoke. The voice was a man. His breathing was once again labored and raspy. He simply said, Why isn't little Jessica at school today? Well, I was taken aback, so I asked, Who is this? I thought maybe he was one of the teachers or something. But the man replied and said, Oh, it's her friend, Mr. Xander. If she isn't at school, can Jessica come round to my house and play? Well, he started to giggle, along with more raspy breaths. He said some horrible things, Jess. We need to involve the police and get him locked up. But until then, you need to make sure you're supervised at all times. Well, <laughs> what horrible things did he say, Mom? I asked, but my mom shook her head in defiance. Just that oh, he would hurt you, and he'd enjoy every second of it. My mom wouldn't give any more than that, but I could tell she was shaken by the level of detail that Mr. Xander had gone into. Even to this day, my mother refuses to disclose what Mr. Xander actually threatened he would do to me, and in all honesty, I don't think I want to know. Part 3 well, this occurred back when there weren't any stalking laws. So when my parents did call the police, they said there wasn't much to do about Mr. Xander and his phone calls and waves. As you can imagine, my parents were fuming with a lack of support from law enforcement. They didn't want to wait until Mr. Xander actually did something before the cops would intervene. Over the next couple of weeks, I wasn't allowed to play out in the schoolyard with the rest of the students as Mr. Xander continued to turn up outside the school gates sometimes in his car, sometimes in person. I'd be forced to sit alone in the classroom at recess. Sometimes I'd be set some work to do, other times I'd be sat there with a book. However, more often than not, I'd be left alone with my thoughts. The two thoughts I couldn't get away from were, what would have happened if I'd helped him look for his dog? And, is that what happened to the young child from Kahali ES, who was found murdered? <laughs> Did Mr. Xander kill him? When I was at home, my mother and father forbid me from answering the phone under any circumstances, as his calls were becoming ever more frequent, and ever more graphic. On one of the occasions that he called, my mother answered the phone to him. Me, my brother, and our little sister were huddled in his bedroom. My brother, wanted to know what he was saying, picked up the landline on the upstairs landing and listened in to the conversation. We watched him come back into the bedroom, eyes wide, vacant pale expression pasted across his face. He flopped down beside us on the bed and exhaled. I started to shake my brother and ask him to tell me what he'd said. Now my brother was 16 at the time, now he's a 30 year old adult. He's aware how irresponsible of him it was to tell me, but <laughs> he told mom he's going to get you eventually. He said one night he'll knock on the door and when you answer he'll bite your face off and run away with you to his private place. He told mom she'll never be able to find you and he'll take his sweet time with you. He said he wants to make you suffer and scream in agony for mom and then he said he wants to... My brother's sentence cut short as he vomited while trying to repeat the vile words of Mr. Zander. He had told my mother... He'd violate me and sodomize me. He said he couldn't wait to use his toys on me. He told her that he'd send her pictures of my screaming face on Christmas Day, and she could think of that every time she looked at the empty place that she still said at the dinner table. God, he told her my death would be the kindest thing you'd do for me. Now, I imagine a few of you are disgusted by that. Imagine my mother, who had to get the intricate details about the intended torture, rape, and murder of her eldest daughter from a disturbed and sick individual who had clearly fantasized about it for weeks. But the calls didn't end there. One afternoon in particular, the phone rang and my mother answered. Me and my brother once again huddled around the upstairs phone, covering the speaker with her hands so Mr. Xander couldn't hear us, but we could hear him. We listened to the conversation that went as follows. Hello, is that Mrs. Murphy? It's Mr. Xander here. I was just wondering if I could come round and have my play date with little Jessica. 
just at the end of the road. I could pop in now. His childish excitement was spine-tingling to listen to. You sick fuck. You best get away from our house or my husband will come out and you'll be sorry. My mom attempted to scare him away. <laughs> nice try, Mrs. Murphy. Mr. Murphy's been away for a few days now. It's just you and those kids in that house. It's up to you. I'll knock and you can open. Hand over little Jessica to me and I'll be on my way or... I might just come back tonight and let myself in. He called my mother out on her lie and this made her feel extremely vulnerable. She stayed quiet, not knowing what to say. Mm, yeah, maybe I'll use my brand new bowing knife to prise open that dodgy window that Mr. Murphy just hasn't had the time to get around to fixing yet. Maybe I'll creep up the stairs while you sleep. Maybe I'll drag Jessica into your room and make her watch me slit you from waist to face. Maybe I'll take Jessica's hand, Rachel. Hmm. Maybe I'll send you a videotape of my forcing them down on my table and drive my razor-sharp bowie knife right up there. My mom slammed the phone down before he could continue any further. She made one last phone call to my dad and informed him that she was unplugging the phone as she couldn't cope anymore. When my father arrived back at the weekend, the first thing he did, under advice from an old cop friend, was go out and invest in a phone that had caller ID. My father told the phone company he was getting some nuisance calls, so they provided him with a piece of call screening equipment that only accepted calls from recognized numbers. Well, this gave us some respite from his calls, but this caused him to try other methods. One afternoon, during one of my classes, my teacher got a message from reception. She told me that my father would be here to pick me up from school today. I was to meet him out back so that Mr. Zander wouldn't spot us and potentially follow us. Well, I was nervous because if my father was back from work early, then something serious must have happened once again. I sat in my chair dreading about what this sicko had done now. The final bell went, and I made my way to the rear entrance of the school. It was where the gym students make their way out onto the sports fields after they'd gotten changed. It was away from the main road, and unless you were familiar with the school, you wouldn't know it existed. I exited the building and saw my father stood with his back to me, talking on his mobile phone, wearing his usual brown trucker's jacket and his Texas Freight Services cap. I made my way over to him, checking side to side, making sure Mr. Zander wasn't around. I started to run over to him, when something felt off. I got to within a few feet of my dad when the principal grabbed my arm and yanked me back. Get inside now. He pulled me so hard I stumbled back. If it wasn't for another teacher catching me and ushering me inside, I would have fallen over. The man who was dressed as my father bolted towards the trees that surrounded the school's playing fields. As he got to the tree line, he turned to me as I looked through the glass window of the rear exit. It was Mr. Zander. He took his cap off and held it out. He then bowed like some sort of sick curtsy after what he obviously thought was a good portrayal of my father. He also made an inch sign with his thumb and finger as if to say, <laughs> Nearly gotcha. Well, the principal informed me that, simply by luck, he'd seen me walking towards the rear exit and asked my teacher what I was doing there. They told him about my father picking me up. Well, the principal and my father were on good speaking terms, and he knew my father worked away all week, and knew for a fact it was my mother picking me up today. I believe his quick thinking, and even quicker running, truly saved my life that day. Part 4 After the school incident, the school and my parents decided for the greater good of not just my safety, but the rest of the students as well, that I homeschool until this ordeal was over. However, when access to me via the phones and school was totally denied, Mr. Zander's behaviour escalated. One afternoon, I was sat at the dinner table with my mum, Rachel and Daniel, eating our evening meal. Daniel was texting a girly light, while Mum moaned at him to not bring his phone to the dinner table whilst making sure Jessica ate her greens. 
I was sneaking Storm some scraps under the table. I was too full to eat. Well, Storm is greedy, even for a dog. So when he was ignoring the piece of gravy-soaked beef protruding from my hand, I knew something had caught his attention. Or someone. His eyes were fixated on the kitchen. What is it, boy? I asked him. He started to maneuver himself into the archway where the dining room and the kitchen met. His back arched as his head lowered, and a low-pitched growl began to emerge from him as his senses closed in on the danger. My mother and siblings were blissfully unaware of Storm's increasingly defensive stance, while I slid my chair back from the table and made my way carefully over to the dog. Jess, honey, please finish your food before you... leave the table, my mum said, her sentence began to slow and trail off as she noticed my worried expression and the growling dog. Daniel and my mum rose from their seats carefully and also made their way over to Storm. We stood huddled together behind Storm as he began to get increasingly more aggressive, aiming his snarls at the slightly ajar pantry door. Just as Storm barked and ran towards the pantry door, it flew open and Mr. Xander came bolting out into the kitchen. We all screamed, which caused Storm to attack him. He launched at Mr. Xander, but he yanked the door open and slammed it shut before Storm could get a bite in. He stood on the other side of the door, stood there for a few seconds and just... smiled at us. It was a disgusting, sinister smile that was so painfully wide but yet showed no teeth. His eyes were borderline demonic and they made all of us quiver. After a few seconds, he simply giggled like a small child and ran off into the trees behind our house. My mother called the police and reported a home invasion. They told us not to touch anything until they got there. After around 30 minutes, a couple of deputies arrived at the house. One searched the local area for signs of Mr. Zander, while the other inspected our house and took statements from us. From his search of the house, it looked like Mr. Zander had finagled his way into the house via the garage. But the creepy thing is, the only time the garage door is open is when my mum brings the car in after running her errands, and the garage door showed no signs of damage, which means he'd either follow my mum's car in, but seeing as my mum always reversed parts, the more likely option was he'd hidden in the back seat. That wasn't even the most disturbing find, though. Inside the pantry, we found wrappers from power bars as well as a large bottle of urine. Mr. Zander had been in that room for at least 24 hours. We found old pictures of me that had been taken from our photo albums. We also found some of my underwear. The sick bastard had been in my room. And given that I'd been homeschooled for the past four days, I can only assume it must have been while I was sleeping. The cops took DNA samples that Mr. Zander had left on my underwear and pictures. They said they'd hopefully be able to ID him from this, if he had a record. But other than that, there wasn't much they could do. They pointed out that Mr. Alex Zander was clearly a pseudonym of some kind. We gave them what descriptive details we could on his appearance, and they advised us to invest in a security system. My mum called my dad and filled him in on what had happened. He said he was going to speak to an old friend who was a retired cop to see what our options were. It took a few nights for us all to start sleeping easy again. We let Storm off his chain in the back garden to act as watchdog until my dad returned home. Around four days after the home invasion incident, we all woke up and, as usual, my mum was the first one up. She made her way downstairs to prepare breakfast for us all. The sounds of her using the bathroom and waking her way along the upstairs hallway stirred me from my slumber. I lay there half awake, listening to the steps creak as my mum made her way into the kitchen. I closed my eyes, telling myself, five more minutes, and began to snooze. When all of a sudden, I was awoken by the sheer despair of my mother's high-pitched scream. She'd looked out of our French doors that connect the dining room to the garden, only to find my beautiful white wolf, my best friend in the whole world, Storm, hanging from the washing line. He'd been cruelly butchered with some sort of blade. His neck and torso had been slit and all four of his paws had been dismembered. 
The sick fuck had even written woof, woof in blood on the kitchen window. Well, we all knew at this point that Mr. Zander was becoming increasingly malevolent and sadistic. He was circling us like a shark, and he smelt blood. My dad wasn't here to protect us, and now neither was Storm. Soon, the games would be over. Soon, Mr. Xander would make his move. Part 5 That weekend, my dad returned from his route. He burst in through the door and embraced us all. Partially to comfort us about the death of our beloved Storm, but mainly because he knew we were lucky that none of us were hurt as well. We all gathered in the living room and discussed the dark situation that had bestowed itself upon our family. Mr. Zander was a problem that wasn't going to go away, and was also a problem that was worsening by the day. What are we going to do, Mike? He's been in our house. He's been in your daughter's bedroom. He's killed our dog, and the police say there's nothing they can do. We need to do something. My mum broke down as she screamed at my father. My dad hushed her calmly. I've spoken with Jim Reynolds, you know, the retired cop. He does security work and he's agreed to watch over you guys while I'm away, my dad informed. But we can't afford private security, Mike. We aren't the freaking Kardashians, my mother wailed again, obviously not coping with the family's current predicament. My father consoled her once again. Why don't we just kill him? My brother shouted immaturely. Because that's illegal, Daniel. It makes us no better than him, my mother answered, ever the diplomat. Actually, Jill, Jim has given me this, my father said, pulling out a small black handgun. Whoa, a Beretta Storm, cool dad, Daniel exclaimed, lunging for the pistol with his hands. It's not a toy, my dad informed, pulling it back out of his reach. Permit holders only, he said sternly. What do you have a gun for? I asked. I've uh, requested some time off work so I can be here to protect you guys. Maybe when he sees you're not vulnerable and I'm around, he'll go focus on someone else. My father answered. I couldn't tell if he really believed that. But Mike, we can't afford to lose your wage. My mom said despairingly. My father interrupted her before she went off on a tangent. It's fine. I have around 25 days paid leave. I just need to work two weeks' notice, but until then, Jim Reynolds says he'll sit outside the house on a night. Make sure no one's trying to sneak in the house. He's agreed to do it on the cheap for me. Mates raid, he calls it. What happens if it isn't resolved in 25 days, though, Mike? My mom inquired. I'm going to use that three and a half weeks to search for a new job. One that's closer to home. He won't try anything when I'm in the house. Besides, it's my constitutional right as an American citizen to defend my home from intruders, using my registered firearm. That's what Jim has always told me. As long as I shoot him in the chest and not the back, he'll be seen as lawful. Besides, he's trespassing on my property and has a history of violence and threat towards my family. No one would question that decision. So on Sunday night, Jim Reynolds came over to our house. He sat us down and my father introduced us to him. This is a very old friend of mine, kids. This is Uncle Jim. He's going to be watching the house, so you guys will be perfectly safe until Daddy's home, okay? My father said, warm smile as he put a friendly arm around the weathered yet burly man that stood in front of us. Now, Jim Reynolds wouldn't look out of place on a ranch or a poppy farm. Nor would you bat an eye if you were informed that he was part of a motorcycle club. He seemed friendly enough, but the man could definitely handle himself, even at his current age. He pulled off the sunglasses and cowboy hat, better than the love child of Indiana Jones and the Terminator. Jim said he'd arrive at our house at 8pm every night. He'd patrol the area every hour to look for signs of Mr. Zander. The rest of the time, he'd sit in his car and keep watch. That night, my father hopped in his car and drove to the depot, leaving us for another five days. At least this time, though, in the hands of one of his most trusted friends. Jim's first few shifts were essentially uneventful. He turned up, did his job, and left the next morning. Nevertheless, it was the best we'd slept in weeks. However, on the fourth night, the night before my father returned, 
The unthinkable happened. I was sat in the living room, watching Kelly Clarkson win American Idol, when I decided to peek out of my window. I saw Uncle Jim sat in his car, which was parked up across the street. I smiled to myself, thinking this was the most time without any Mr. Xander incidents, no matter how big or small. Maybe this had worked. Maybe he'd seen this was too much risk now. Maybe it was all over. Jim fired his car to life and took a slow drive forward, making his way round his hourly patrol. I sat back on my bed, scooching up to the headboard and grabbed the framed picture of me and Storm from when I was a baby and he was a puppy. I looked at it fondly before holding it close to my chest. God, I miss you so much, baby boy. Around 25 minutes had passed when I heard Jim's car pull back up to its position on the opposite side of the road to our house. His car door opened and I heard footsteps coming close to the house. The doorbell rang moments later. I crept out of my room and snuck down the hall to the top of the stairs. My mum answered the door, the chain still on, of course, when I heard Jim say, Sorry to bother you, Jill. I was doing my patrol when I noticed some of your panels in the garden fence have been removed. Oh, it could be an easy way for that creep to sneak into the back while I'm out front. It seems quiet tonight. I've got some tools in the back. I could fix that right up for you. His voice sounded smoother this evening, not as low and booming. Something wasn't right. Um, yeah, sure. Here, come through the house, I'll make you a coffee, my mom said. Sure, Jim, I'll just grab my tools, said Jim. My mom undid the deadbolt and made her way into the kitchen. I heard the sound of the pot boiling as I ran back to my bedroom, dived onto my bed and peered out of the window. Jim walked back to the car and opened his rear side door, presumably to get his tools. And that's when the limp body of a burly man slumped out of the car, his jacket, shades and hat all missing. It was Jim. The man pushed him back into the car, pulled out a big black duffel and turned to face the house. He was smiling, that same sinister, painfully white smile with no teeth shown. I knew by the way his cheeks pushed up his sunglasses that underneath was Mr. Xander. I screamed at the top of my lungs as hard as I could. Mom! She couldn't hear me, though. The TV in the living room plus the kettle boiling was just enough to drown me out. Mr. Xander was now skipping towards our unlocked door. I screamed one more time. Mom! He's here! Lock the door! I screamed so hard that Mr. Xander stopped in his tracks and stared up at my window. Using his free hand, he picked his sunglasses off his face and slowly revealed his crazy wild eyes. And his smile never dropped as he stared right at me. Jim, coffee's ready, my mum yelled from the living room. I couldn't even think straight. I was too busy shitting my pants, looking at him and wondering what he had in the bag. Well, I'm coming, Jill. Oh, I'm coming, he said, power walking towards the slightly open door. I snapped into life, shouted my mum one more time, but it was too late. She was too far from the door to stop him. Thankfully, Daniel had pulled himself from his Xbox and Halo long enough to not have a pair of headphones on. He'd heard my bout of screams and had acted accordingly. He was already halfway down the stairs, and he dove feet first into the corner of the front door, and the door slammed shut, just as Mr. Xander's gloved hand clasped the frame. The impact made him curse and snap his head back. Daniel pushed his back up against the door, and my mum ran and engaged the deadbolts. Son, are you still there? Please let me know what's happening. Officers are on the way, but I want to know if you're okay. A voice echoed through the upstairs landline that was dangling by its cord from the table. I picked it up. Hello? I asked curiously. Hello, 911 dispatch. I was speaking to a young male who called us to say a man was in your house. And then he just dropped the phone. He, he's outside now. He's trying to get in. He's hurt our Uncle Jim. He killed our dog and now he's trying to kill me. I rambled back to them. Officers on the way. 
Can you get into a room until we can get there? She asked, just as my mum came up the stairs and signalled for the phone. She told me and my brother to take my little sister into my room and barricade the door. My mum then stayed on the phone to the dispatcher and sat with her back against our door. The thing I'll never forget was the large butcher's knife that she was holding, ready to get bloody and protect her children if this sick bastard was to find his way in. We all looked out of the window. We couldn't see him, meaning he was either round back or he was at the front door. The doorbell rang, followed by a slow, deliberate knock. Mr. Zander pushed open our letterbox and began to shout up to us. Piggy, piggy, piggies, open this door or I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll kick this door in. Daniel opened the window and yelled down at the street. The pigs that are coming to you are the fucking cops, you freak. They'll be here any minute. Mr. Zander took two large backward steps until he came into view, his sinister smile still plastered on his face. He tilted his head up at us. Daniel, there's no need for name-calling. I'm not here for you, nor your mother. You're both a little old for my taste, <laughs> he said, chuckling. I want my little Jessica. I've waited long enough now, I think. I won't wait any longer. Doesn't matter how many fat old men or sniffling mutts you put outside your house. You won't be safe until I get what I want. And what I want is to take your sister and shove... Daniel slammed the window shut before I heard anything that would scar me. He held me and my sister close, making sure his arms covered our ears. It only seemed a few seconds later, and we saw the blue and red lights flickering in the dark room. The cops had arrived. After a few more moments, my mum told us the police were here and we could come out. We walked downstairs tentatively. There were around four or five offices in our house and garden. Three were searching the area for signs of Mr. Zander. One was radioing for an ambulance for Uncle Jim, and the other was taking our statements. Uncle Jim was pronounced dead at the scene. He'd been suffocated with a cellophane bag. They deduced by the broken nose that the bag had been put over his head and pulled from behind with extreme force. Mr. Zander did have a skill for sneaking into back seats of cars. My dad was informed and he broke down crying. I'd never seen my dad crying, so imagining this is a hard thing to do. He promised he'd be home by morning. A couple of cops agreed to stay outside the property until my dad returned. I never found Mr. Zander, but I did find his duffel bag. Inside, the contents were like something from a nightmare. There was a selection of knives, some small and some huge. There were also some things I didn't understand at the time, but now I can tell you it's what's known as a leg spreader. There was also a ball gag, a spiked paddle, and honestly some stuff that I can't even bring myself to write down. Mr. Zander's tools were enough to make a masochist cringe. My dad returned as promised in the morning. We had our weekly group hug. Mr. Zander never tried anything when my dad was at home. We cherished this time with him more than ever. But it also meant that we knew when Monday came, he'd be gone again for five days. And given that this would be the last time that daddy was away, this would be when Mr. Zander made sure he got inside. Part 6 Mike, you can't leave us. He'll come back, my mother pleaded, pulling at my dad's collar with desperation. I have to go, Jill. If I don't, I'll lose my job. Then even if Mr. Zander did leave us alone, we'd have no money. It's just five more days. Keep the doors locked. Don't answer the phone. Keep the phone by the bed, my dad informed my mom. None of us could get over how blasé my father was being about this. His best friend and dog had just been murdered. If it hadn't been for my brother, then God only knows what Mr. Zander would have done to his two daughters with his bag of toys. My father dragged his way from my mother's grasp, picked up his rucksack and walked out to his car. As he got to the car door, he turned to us and said, I'll be back Friday morning, guys. Then I'll be home for good. I promise. 
I love you all. Be safe. He climbed into his car and drove away into the mid-morning sunrise. My mother quickly ushered us back inside and slammed the door shut behind her. Dead bolts and chain were engaged. Over the next three days, a police officer was outside our house day and night. A detective came out and was very interested in Mr. Zander. Not only had he now murdered a former law enforcement officer, but the detective informed us that the DNA samples recovered from our pantry were linked to a handful of high-profile violent crimes in the state of Georgia. Now, for obvious reasons, he couldn't go into details, but I couldn't help think of the brutal rape and murder of that student from Gehaly. We gave the police the best description of Mr. Zander that we could, and we inquired why they didn't know his identity despite him leaving DNA everywhere. They informed us they could only identify him via DNA if they had it on file anyway, i.e. a criminal record. They informed us the only way they could catch him would be red-handed. The detective thanked us for our cooperation and left. He told us to call the police immediately if we spotted him. We told him not to worry, and of course we would. The fourth night came with no events or sightings of Mr. Zander. We were extremely optimistic, because my dad would be home the next day. Maybe he'd decided we were too much of a risk now he'd murdered an ex-cop right outside our house. Around 11pm, the police car outside our house turned on its sirens and flashing lights and sped off into the night. My mother, being concerned, called the detective. He informed her that someone had reported a suspect matching our description of Mr. Zander. They'd reported the suspect as lurking outside a children's centre. An all-units call had been put out to make sure that he didn't get away this time. The police in my area were badly understaffed, and they couldn't afford to have anyone spare. Well, we didn't question it, we just wanted Mr. Zander caught and arrested, so that this really could be over. Around 11.25pm, my mother told us to go to bed, get some sleep. Then, when we wake up, Daddy will be home. We complied, although I couldn't sleep. Something was plaguing my mind. I didn't know Mr. Zander. I couldn't read his mind, but I just didn't buy the whole jumping from tormenting my family to all of a sudden stalking a random children's home situation. Maybe I was just being paranoid. I mean, who could blame me? The house was quiet when I startled awake around 2.34 a.m. I wasn't sure what had actually caused me to snap out of my slumber. Wind, perhaps. And I sat up and listened carefully. I couldn't hear anything, though. Oh, my mouth was so dry, I decided to grab a drink, seeing as I was awake. I made my way down the stairs and into the dark living room. The only light was from the moonlight coming in through the French doors leading into the kitchen. I walked over towards the sink, eyeing the freshly cleaned glass on the rack, imagining how great a pint of fresh OJ would taste on my dry mouth. And that's when I heard the breathing. Gentle at first almost mistook it for my own, but it got raspy and laboured. Oh my baby girl, what are you trying to do to me? Mr. Zander said, hand down the front of his black trousers as he stared wildly at me. I quivered in fear as he seemed to almost drool over my door of the explorer pants. I looked at the living room window, which was slightly ajar. The latch was hanging off, having clearly been prized with a crowbar or knife. I now know what had woken me up. I couldn't even speak. I just started to sob. This was it. Oh, come on now. I've got a little playroom nearby. Let's go, and If you scream, then I'll kill your fucking mom. Then I'll kill your fucking brother. Then I'll take you and your little sister and I'll keep her in a fucking cage until she's old enough to do to what I'm going to do to you, he said as he chuckled sinisterly, biting his lip, touching himself more vigorously. He pulled out a roll of black duct tape from his bomber jacket pocket and he began that awful, terrifying skip towards me. That horrific, toothless smile was plastered across his face. He exuded a childlike excitement for the fun he was going to have with his new plaything. I closed my eyes and waited to feel his gloved hand grab my hair or mouth. I felt something else, though. A hand pushing my shoulder, forcing me to the side. 
I hit the ground and opened my eyes. I looked up to see Mr. Zander's sinister smile was now one of surprise and almost humour. I turned to look what had pushed me over and saw my dad standing there, feet planted, core stabilised and his registered firearm extended out in front of him. He was aiming it at Mr. Zander. Oh, good evening, Mr. Murphy. I was just about to leave, actually, Mr. Zander said jovially. Not with my daughter, you're not, he replied. He pulled the trigger, and a deafening pop crackled through the tense atmosphere. Mr. Zander's right petrol popped like a watermelon. A flash of red and smoke exploded from the wound, and he fell back into the glass coffee table which shattered into a million little shards. My dad stood over the body and looked down at the man who terrorized his family for the last month. You're not the only one who can hide in the pantry. Now, rot in hell, you sick bastard, he quipped as my mom and siblings came rushing down the stairs. Oh my god! My mum exclaimed at the violent scene now, and her $2,000 coffee table. Mike, what is... I don't... My mum started to mumble in confusion at what had happened. My dad ran to embrace her, as did I. He told Daniel to call the police and tell them he'd just shot an intruder in his home. Daniel complied and ran upstairs. I'm sorry, honey, I really am. I couldn't tell you what I was planning... I needed him to really believe I'd left so he'd make his move, my dad said, as he held my mum tighter. How long were you in there, dad? I asked, shocked. I still couldn't believe he was here. Work had given me two months' compassionate leave. They're well aware of what's been happening, so they told me to take the time. We needed a more permanent solution. This sicko would just wait until I went back to work or whatever, and then he'd try something. Stayed in a motel for a couple of days. Collected a few supplies such as water, power bars, and a burner phone. This morning I snuck into the house through the back door. Hid in the pantry. Yeah, it was me who made the call to the police about the children's home. Well, Jim had always spoke about the low police numbers in this area. And there's no higher profile suspect than a cop killer. My dad informed us. Police are on the way, Dad. Daniel shouted down. Thanks, son. So, anyway, I just sat in the dark, waiting. I heard the sirens go off, so I knew the cop outside had left. After that, it was just a waiting game. A few hours later, I heard the window being forced with something like a crowbar, and I knew it was him. My dad continued. He then turned to look at me. Jessica, I'm sorry you saw that. You weren't meant to come downstairs. I was making sure the safety was off. The gun was loaded and, well, I was ready to shoot someone. That's when I heard the stairs going. I assumed it was him going up the steps, so I started to carefully open the door. That's when I noticed the steps were getting closer. And then I heard him speak to you. My dad was so focused on his story, he didn't notice Mr. Zander sit up with his knife. Dad! I screamed, just as Mr. Zander pulled the knife back, ready to drive it into my dad's torso. A loud crash echoed through the house as my mother slammed the large glass flower vase down on the top of Mr. Zander's skull. The knife fell from his limp hand and he slumped back into his supine position. My father looked up at his wife of 26 years and chuckled with a manner that suggested he never knew she had it in her. My mother looked down at the limp pedophile on her living room floor, admiring her handiwork. I never liked that vase anyway, she confessed. Hey, I got you that, Daniel moaned, and we all shared a laugh. The first in weeks. The police arrived shortly after. The ambulance workers revived Mr. Zander at the scene. He was taken into custody while at Northside Hospital in Cherokee. He was cuffed to his bed under 24-hour watch of the GBI. Turns out Mr. Zander wasn't just an obsessive stalker. He was something much, much darker. You see, I told the officers about Mr. Zander's playroom that he was going to take me to, 
Police found a set of keys on him relating to two residents, both in Georgia, one of which was his personal residence. And the other key was linked to a warehouse just off the highway. In the basement of that warehouse was what can only be described as a sadistic torture chamber. Gauges, tables with shackles, whips, blades, hundreds of various sized instruments that would even make Christian Grey wind. Inside the Chamber of Horrors, they found body fluids relating to over ten murdered children going back eight years. Seems that Mr. Zander, whose real name was Matthew Brooke, according to his medical records, would take his victims to the warehouse that he'd acquired in a will twelve years ago. Here he would play with the victims, and after a few days, when they'd run their course, they'd be discarded in a nearby woodland area. Matthew Brooke was able to get away with this for so long as he'd never been in trouble with the police. They didn't have his prints or DNA on file, and he had no surviving family who were on the police database either. According to witness statements taken by GBI, his landlord, work colleagues and neighbours described him as a model tenant, an angel of a neighbour and a pillar of the community. No one who knew him by his real name knew he was a violent and sadistic predator. Mr. Brooke, a.k.a. Mr. Zander, or whatever he calls himself, was moved to Georgia State Prison once he was medically cleared. He's still alive to this day, sitting in his cell, behind bars where he belongs. At his trial, DNA evidence convicted him of all 32 counts of stalking, abduction, rape, murder, and mutilation of a corpse. He's to serve a combined term of 325 years, with no chance of early release. I hope the following people are looking down and now can rest peacefully knowing their killer was brought to justice. Tanya Evans, Emily Price, Emma Ryan, Harry Bishop, Tyler Davis, Marie Duncan, William Jessup, Jody Hepburn, Danny Mendez and Riley Ashworth. You'll never be forgotten. It's been almost 19 years since this nightmare. I've grown up, settled down with my partner and have kids of my own. But the uh, reason I'm dragging this all up now is because... Today, as I stood in the kitchen, my little girl came in from school and ran up to me crying. I picked her up and cradled her like she was two years old again. I held her tight, assured her everything was okay, and asked her what was wrong. A scary man followed me home. I didn't like him. He kept asking me to try and help find his dog. Jessica's mom. Jessica's dad. Suck on that, Mr. Zander. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't mess with kids, man, I tell you. There's no wrath like that of a parent whose kid is in danger. Now that is based on one of the most popular Let's Not Meet stories ever. Uh, so, uh, but nicely added to and elaborated on by Mr. Luke Hemingway. Always a delight to do one of his stories. So, oh, look at this. Might be an hour on the dot again this evening. Let's see if I can fix things so it is. Oh, here we go. You ready? Well, back again very soon. Lots of good stuff coming up. Reverse Vampires returning very soon. I haven't done that for a long time, but it's coming very soon. More of the I'm a Monster series as well. So, see you again very soon. Till the next time. Very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.